All right, good morning, everyone. So just kind of quickly recap what we talked about yesterday. So again, we can combine capacitors in parallel with series, where we can find them in parallel. The equivalent capacitance, which is created by combining these guys in parallel, is equal to simply the sum over all of the capacitors, which means that it increases the overall capacitance. And then if we add them in series, we have to inversely add them together. So one over the equivalent capacitance is then equal to the sum over one over all the capacitances, which has the effect of decreasing the overall capacitance. So let's do another example. So this one says that we have a battery which has 12 volts worth of potential is then connected to these four capacitors where C1 here and C4 have exactly the same capacitance, which is six microfarads. Uh, C2 then is then twice the size of C1 and then C3 is half the size of C1. So I want to know then what is the charge on that capacitor? That's all we want to know in this case. What's the charge on that single capacitor? So <clears throat> let's do this. So I already drew this guy out this way. So this is twice the size of C1. I've done the wrong number. <clears throat> Good. So here's again a quick picture. Sometimes I'll write this as delta V and sometimes I'll just write it as V. It's the same thing, basically. Because again, Delta V just means the potential difference between this point and this point, but we're usually going to set this guy equal to zero, which means the total potential is just 12 volts. Right? So basically the same thing. So, oops, I forgot one line. Okay, there we go. So as we talked about yesterday, basically what we have to do is first combine everything down together that's in parallel and series to then find the overall equivalent capacitance. To do that, we're going to draw the steps. So basically I'm going to draw how I combine everything down because as we talked about also yesterday, whatever's in parallel has to have the same potential and whatever's in series has to have the same charge. Which basically means that to find the charge on this guy, I first have to collapse this thing all the way down to a single capacitor, find the equivalent charge, and then unravel what it was that I did using the fact that what's in series has the same charge, what's in parallel has the same potential, to then fully unravel this thing to determine how much charge is on this guy. Right. Again, mathematically speaking, this is easy. It's a little bit tedious because again, I have to go all the way in one direction and then undo what I just did going all the way backwards. So I have to do it basically twice. Right. We'll see that as we go through this problem. So the first thing I need to identify is what is in parallel and what's in series. So here, what's in parallel and what is in series? So this is the first thing I need to identify. So by looking at this guy, what's in parallel and what's in series? So what do you think? What's in parallel and what is in series? So what's in parallel with those? C1 and C2 be parallel? Good, C1 and C2 are in parallel. So we know these two guys are in parallel. But if C1 is in C2 is in parallel, then what about C3 and C4? also parallel. So these guys are also in parallel. So I can combine these down together to then create two equivalent capacitors. We're going to have one C1, C2, one C3, C4. But then how is C1, C2, and C3, C4 connected? They're in series with each other. So, so the first thing I'm going to do is redraw this so that now I have my battery here connected now to these two guys. So this is C1, 2, Work. There we go. Connected then in series to then C3, 4. And now I'm going to combine these together to then give me the final, which is then my final picture, which is finally my equivalent capacitance. Let's call this guy V, call this guy V. Is okay? So good. by looking at here, because of this node here and this node here, I know that these guys have to be in parallel with each other. So I can identify these are in parallel. Again, because of this node and this node, as well as this node, these guys have to be in parallel. So these are in parallel with each other. Once I combine them, they are then simply in series with each other. So then I can combine those down to C, D, Q. So good. So that's the first step. So we're going to combine all these things down to this stage. So the first thing I have to do then is calculate what is C, E, Q. 
because from CDQ and the potential, I can then find the charge, which is the equivalent charge on the equivalent capacitor. Now, when I go backwards, I then have to understand that CDQ came from two capacitors, which are in series, but what's the same in series? Potential or charge? I'll give you a hint. not potential. Good. Charge is the same. So the charge that I have here has to be the same as the charge that's here and here. Once I know the charge that's here and here, I now know that this one came from two which were in parallel. What's the same in parallel? Potential. I know this one has the charge, so I know this has the potential, which is the same as here and here. Once I know that potential, then I can unravel to this stage to say, well, this one has the same potential as this one, so I can finally find this charge. Okay. So we have to go all the way in one direction and then all the way back in the other direction. So let's do that. So first things first, let's calculate C12. C12 came from two capacitors which were in parallel, which means we're simply going to add these guys together. So C12 then is equal to C1 plus C2, which means in this case, this is equal to C plus C1 plus 2C1, which is the same thing as 3C1, which is then equal to 18 microfarads. C34 came from C3 and C4 in parallel, which means we're also going to add those two together, which means C3 is half of C1, C4 is equal to C1. So it's going to be one and a half, which is then three halves of C1. Three halves of C1 is simply nine, right? Good. <clears throat> okay. Finally, I'm going to switch to another page here. CEQ came from two which were in series with each other, which means to get CEQ, we have to inversely add these guys together. So one over CEQ then is equal to one over C12 plus one over C34, which means CEQ then is equal to C12 times C34 divided by C12 plus C34. <coughs> Everybody okay with this? I just did a little bit of algebra here. Okay. Now, one thing I don't want you to do is to think that it always looks like this all the time. Okay, which means that if I had, I'm gonna do a little adjacent over here. If you had that one over CEQ was equal to say one over C1 plus one over C2 plus one over C3. And then you said that, well, obviously then CEQ then is equal to C1, C2, C3 divided by C1 plus C2 plus C3 because that's what I did in class. What's wrong with this? First thing we can notice is that it does not have the correct dimensions. Okay. Because the left-hand side is C, what's the right-hand side? Well, it's C cubed divided by C, but what's C cubed divided by C? C squared. Right? So if I simply did that, this would be a C is equal to C squared, which is obviously not correct. Right? So I have to do a little bit of algebra to get to that stage. The actual correct answer would this be C1, C2, C3 divided by C1, C2 plus C1, C3 plus C2, C3. This is the actual correct answer. So just because I do this doesn't mean this generalizes to this. Okay? So just be careful. Okay? So good. So let's plug in our numbers. So here, what I get then is C12 is equal to what? 3C, this times 3 halves C, divided by 3C plus 3 halves C, right? So the top then becomes what? 9 fourths C squared divided by, so let's find a common denominator. So this is gonna be the same thing as six halves. So six halves is also nine halves. So this is then divided by nine halves C. Okay, so this C is going to cancel with this one, so it becomes a C on top. This nine will cancel with this one. This is going to make this a two, so this is simply going to be one half of C. So CEQ in this case is half of C, where C was equal to that, so this should be equal to what? Three microfarads, if I did math correctly. Right. Assuming I did math. Was okay. Good. So now let's go back to our picture. So now what we know is that this is equal to simply three microfarads. 
Which means then that once I know this, I can now find the charge on this guy. So from here, I can now say, well, the charge, I'm gonna call that QEQ is then equal to CEQ times the potential across it, which is simply that of the battery. So this is then gonna be equal to what? C1 times the potential divided by two. So this is my equivalent charge. Now again, my equivalent charge or my equivalent capacitor came from two capacitors which were in series, which means that the charge on here has to be the same as the charge on here, which has to be the same as the charge on the equivalent capacitor. Which means that I now know the charge here is QEQ, and I also know that this charge here is also QEQ. Okay. Now that I know QEQ, and I know the capacitance here, I can now find a potential difference across these plates. So the potential difference across these plates, let's call that V34, is then equal to charge QEQ divided by the capacitance C34. Good, so from here, we know QEQ now is equal to what? One half of C1V divided by C34, where C34 is equal to three halves of C1. So these are gonna cancel, so that's gonna become equal to what? One third, right? So this is gonna be equal to one third of the potential. <coughs> Now that I know this potential, well, I know that this capacitor here came from two capacitors which were in parallel. What's the same in parallel? The potential. So that means that the potential across this one is V34 and the potential across this one is also V34. Which means that now, since I know the potential, I also know the charge, I can now figure out the, or sorry, the capacitance, I can now figure out the amount of charge on this guy. So finally, what we can say then is that the charge Q4 is then equal to V34 times the capacitance C4. V34 is equal to one third of the potential times C4, but C4 is simply equal to C1. So this finally becomes one third of 12 times C1, where C1 was equal to six microfarads. So this is now equal to four. So this is going to be equal to what? 24 microcoulombs. So this is my amount of charge. Okay. So any problem that you're going to do like this always is going to be done the same way. Okay, step number one, you're going to identify what is in series and what is in parallel. Once you identify what's in series, what's in parallel, you're going to start combining things. As you start combining them, you're going to draw pictures on how you go from one step to another step. That way, when you track and go backwards, you know what came from what, which means you now know what was in parallel, what's in series, so what's the same. Again, what's the same in series has to be the charge. What's the same in parallel has to be the potential. So once you get to this stage, you can now find Q and Q, go backwards. Again, if these two are in series, they have to have the same charge. I now know this is the same charge as Q and Q, so is this one. Once I know the charges, I also know the capacitances. I can now find the potentials. From the potentials, these things were now in parallel, which means they have to have the same potential. Now I know the potentials, which means I can now find the charges. These things will always work this way. Okay? Sure. I got CEQ. Good. So from CEQ, I know that first I combine these two to give me C12 and C34. And then these two I combine to then give me CEQ, where these guys were combined in series. So I kind of did that on a separate page as well. So here, what I know is. C12 were in series, or sorry, parallel. So I simply add them together. So I have a C1 plus a 2C1, which gave me a 3C1. And then C34 was C4, which is C1, plus then half of that, which then gives me the three halves. 
And then I did CEQ on this page. So CEQ then is from two, which were in series, which means I have to inversely add them together. So I have one over CEQ or one over C12 plus one over C34. And then invert that to find then CEQ. Uh, can you say that again? Yes. Yeah, that's one over 18 plus one over, what was the other one? Uh, nine, yeah. So it should be one over 18 plus one over nine and then invert that, yeah. Isn't that what? Did I not add things right here? So I get nine halves. Oh, I wrote that as nine halves, not, sorry. I wrote that as nine fourths, not nine halves. You're absolutely right. So this should be a nine halves. This was also a nine halves. So this actually should be C1. Right, so that should be six. Thank you, Derek. So that means this one half here wasn't actually here. So this should actually be six. So that one half there and shouldn't be there. That should just be C1, V1, which means that this guy should be without the half. So three halves. You're making me do it all over again. Okay. So QEQ -E -Q then was equal to what? C1, V1 divided by this guy. So this is three halves C1. So that's going to cancel. So this should be two thirds, not one third. Good. So the two thirds from there, then that gave me going back to where did I do that? So here, this should actually be two thirds. So that gives me a four times two, which is actually an eight. And then, uh, good, yeah, two thirds of that. And then, so that should be double the size, right? So that's 48, okay, <laughs> good, sorry. Yeah, right, for some reason I called that a fourth instead of a half like I should have. Well, I was going to try to go too fast. Right. Corey. Would it work out the same if you started with C1 and C3 being in series? No. 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 And unfortunately, I can't do that. So if I look at here, these two can't be in series because of this node. So the presence of this node here forces the fact that charge has to be able to go through. So these two can't be in series. So they cannot be in series with each other. So unfortunately, and then I can't really say that this one is in parallel with this one because there's no line here. So if there was another line here, so what this is saying is what, if there's another line here, then this one can be in parallel with this one, but the way it's set up here because of this node and this node, then what it's telling me is that these two are in series with these two together because of the way that the nodes are set up. But again, I can't say that this is in series with this one because of the presence of that node. That's okay. So, as we talked about, the point of having a capacitor is to store energy. So let's talk about the energy which is stored then by the capacitor. So again, just to remind you how this works is again, here's my capacitor, here's my second conductor. I'm then going to connect this to a battery. Now, again, what's going to happen is I'm going to take a small amount of charge, DQ, let's call this DQ, and I'm going to push that onto this plate. So eventually this thing is going to become positively charged. This thing then is going to become negatively charged, which is then going to set up some sort of potential difference. Let's call that V across the plates. Now, what we said was that every time I try to put a small amount of charge DQ onto these planes, I have to overcome this Coulomb repulsion to force this charge of DQ then onto this plate. So the amount of work it takes then is the amount of work it takes to force that DQ onto this charged plate to overcome this potential difference between the plates. Mm -hmm. So the amount of work it takes for me to put this charge on then is equal to the potential times DQ. Because remember that work was equal to minus the change of potential energy, which is equal to minus the charge 
times the change of potential. So here I'm just calling the change of potential V instead. And then here, this is the work that I'm doing, not the work done by the electric field, which is why it's positive instead of negative. Which means then that the total amount of work that it takes for me to push this charge on or all the charges until this thing becomes fully charged. So if this thing has a fully charged charge of Q, then the total amount of work is then equal to the sum over all of these differential works from the amount of charge of zero up to the maximum amount of charge of Q. Which means this is then equal to the integral from zero to the maximum charge of then the potential integrated over dq. But remember that the potential is not independent of the charge because for capacitors, the charge is equal to the capacitance times the potential, which means here we can rewrite this then as one over the capacitance times the integral from zero to q, of uh, then q dq. Okay, let's write that on this page. So the work then it takes for me to put all the charges on there is one over the capacitance integral from zero to the maximum charge of the charge integrated over the charge. Well, what's the integral of Q dQ? Or is the integral of X dX? And it's something that you're more familiar with the Q dQ. What's the integral of X dX? One half x squared. So this becomes one over two c times q squared evaluated from zero to q, which means that this is going to be equal to q squared divided by two c. So this is the amount of work it takes for me to charge this capacitor to its maximum amount of charge of q. But as we talked about yesterday, that's also equal to the amount of energy stored by the capacitor. So this is equal to the energy stored. So the energy which is stored by the capacitor is simply equal to the amount of work done, where the work in this case is simply equal to the charge squared divided by twice the capacitance. But we also know that the charge is equal to the capacitance times the potential, which means I could actually rewrite then the charge as C times V. So this is also equal to C squared V squared divided by two C. There we go, which is then equal to what? V squared divided by, 2C. I'm oh, sorry. I could do math today. Go away. C V squared over two. There we go. <clears throat> or I can rewrite the C as then Q over V. So I could also rewrite this as let's do that on another page. So I could also write that the energy stored is equal to one half. Q squared over C, but again, C I can write as Q over V. So I could also write this then as what? One half of Q squared times V divided by Q, which is then equal to one half <coughs> QV. So this means that for the energy stored by a capacitor, I can write this one of three ways. I can either write this as one half times the charge squared divided by the capacitance, the capacitance times the potential squared, or the charge times the potential. Any one of these are equivalents. And they all have the one half multiplied out from it. So don't forget about that one half. So the question is, which one do I use? Well, the answer is, well, which one do I know? If I know the charge and the capacitance, I use the first one. If I know the charge and the voltage, I use the last one. If I know the capacitance and the voltage, I use the second one. So whichever one that I decide to use just depends on what it is I know about my circuit, which means I'm just going to use the most convenient one that I have. So if I already know these two things and I would have to calculate the potential, well, why do that when I already know that? I don't have to do that. So the energy then stored by our capacitor is then simply equal to one of these three things. This is our energy stored via the that capacitor. So what this one says is we can think about the fact that the energy is stored by charging the capacitor. So all the energy is stored with inside of the capacitance itself or with inside of the charge. This one says that the energy is stored inside of the potential. Since I don't have a charge here, 
And I can think about the fact there's a potential difference between the two plates. So in that case, all the energy is stored within inside of the potential difference. This one says that the energy is stored within both the charge and the potential difference across the two. But there's also an electric field in between as well. So remember that if I have a parallel plate capacitor, or this one say is positively charged, this one is negatively charged, so I have an electric field. We can also say the electric field stores the energy as well. And the way we're going to do that is let's look at what's known as little u, which is equal to the energy stored per unit volume. This is what's known as the energy density. So the energy density then has units of joules per meter cubed. So this is our energy density. So let's think about the energy density. Right? So we now know that the energy stored is equal to, let's do it this way. Uh, this is equal to, which one do I want to use? I suppose it doesn't matter. But I'll choose one. Uh, yeah, let's do it this way. So let's write this as one half the capacitance times the voltage squared. Let's use that one. Now let's pretend this is a parallel plate capacitor. So we know the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is equal to epsilon naught times the area divided by the distance. And we know the potential across the plates is simply equal to the electric field times the distance. Something that we found yesterday when we integrated across the parallel plates. So let's put these things together. So this is going to be equal to one half epsilon naught times the area divided by the distance times then the electric field squared times the distance squared. So this is then equal to one half epsilon naught times the electric field squared times the area times the distance. So the area here is the area of the plate. D then is the distance between the two plates, which means the area times the distance I can also write as what? So area times distance is also known as the volume. Right? So this is the same thing as one half epsilon naught times the electric field squared times the volume. Which means then that the energy density is simply going to be equal to the energy stored, which is one half epsilon naught times the electric field squared times the volume, divided by the volume, which means the volume is simply going to cancel out. So this says then that the energy density is equal to one half epsilon naught times the electric field squared. So this is what we call the energy density. So what this one says is that the energy per unit volume stored with inside of my parallel plate capacitor is simply stored with inside of the electric field itself. So it's not stored within the charge, it's not stored within the potential, it's stored with inside of the electric field. So what this one simply means is that here is my plates. So here's my, my top plate, here's my bottom plate, these guys are again separated by a distance of D. And let's say my electric field in this case points downward. <clears throat> what this one means is if I go in between the plates and I choose a small volume here, then this is the amount of energy density stored within inside of that volume. <clears throat> so if I know the amount of volume that I have here, I'm simply going to take that, multiply by the volume inside of there, which is now going to give me the energy stored. So this one just says that the energy which is stored within inside of my parallel plate capacitor, once this thing is fully charged, is stored with inside of the electric field itself. Okay with this? This is an equivalent way of saying the same thing. So it just means if I reach inside of here and I grab a volume worth of electric field, that's the amount of energy stored within inside of that volume of electric field. If I can grab an electric field. Which I can this one. Okay. Are there other cases that these equations don't work for? Um, well, we kind of cheated a little bit to get to here because we assumed there was a parallel plate capacitor, but it turns out this is actually generic. So it doesn't matter <clears throat> uh, if this was parallel plate capacitors or the original configuration I drew, which was these two blobs, it's the same thing. 
So yeah, even here, if this had an electric field pointing this way, then it just means if I grab the small volume here, then the energy density inside of that is still one half epsilon naught times electric field squared. So, um, so yeah, so it turns out that I cheated to get there, but it's still generic. So, um, and you can actually prove that doing other ways, but we're not going to do that. So, uh, that would take a lot more math. And we're not, we're not going to do that. So, uh, so to answer your question, uh, no, these are all generic for any type of parallel plane or any type of capacitor. Okay. So any one of these, it doesn't have to be parallel plate. It doesn't have to be coaxial. It doesn't have to be concentric spheres. It could be two spheres next to each other. It could be anything. These are generic for any one of those scenarios. So good. Let's do an example. I'll try to write smaller this time so we can actually get all this stuff on that one. So this one says, in the figure below, we have potential difference here V of 100 volts is applied across a capacitor arrangement, which is these three capacitors, where C1 is equal to 10 microfarads, C2 then is equal to 5 microfarads, and then C4 is equal to 4 microfarads. So I want to know, what is the charge? Potential difference and energy stored here. What's the charge, potential difference, and energy stored here? And what is the charge, potential difference, and energy stored here? This is what we want to know. So effectively, what is the charge or potential difference stored across each one of these guys? So let's do that. Let's redraw. I'll try to draw smaller here. Good. So now I have C1 here. Connected to C2, connected to C3. Okay. And again, what I know is C1 is equal to, what was it, 10 microfarads, C2 is equal to 5 microfarads, and C3 was equal to 4 microfarads. Okay. So again, all I want to know is again, across each one of these capacitors, how much charge, how much potential difference, and how much energy is stored by each one. <clears throat> so, now when it comes to capacitor problems, don't be fooled by the fact that here it's asking specifically for part A, find the charge, part B, find the potential, and part C, find the energy on just this one. You cannot do that. As we just saw in the last problem, you have to do all of these things at the same time. Because again, the first thing you have to do is combine them all down, split them all apart, figure out what's on each one. And then once I get there, I can simply report all of these things down. Right? So don't think I have to do part A first. I have to do part B first. When it comes to these, you're basically going to do everything all at the same time. And then go through the mess of what it is that you just did and try to figure out what goes with which one. Okay. So again, so again, the first thing we want to do is determine again what is in parallel and what is in series. So this is the first thing we need to do. So first thing we need to do is identify which ones are in parallel, which ones are in series. So, Corey, which one do you want to take? Uh, C1 and C2 are in series. Good. So first thing I know is that C1 and C2 are connected in series with each other. Good. So let's combine those guys together. So here I'm going to have my battery connected then to C1 and 2, connected in series. And then I have C3 here. Good. Now that those two are connected in series, how then is C1, 2, and C3 connected? They're in parallel with each other. Good. So now what I know is these two guys are in parallel. So finally, I'm going to draw this as here is my final CDQ. So now let's do some math over here. So first things first is I know C12 were connected together in series from C1 and C2. How do I add capacitors in series? Do we add them directly or inversely? Inversely. Good. So from here I know that C12 is equal to C1 C2 divided by C1 plus C2. Good. 
In this case, this is then equal to what? C1 times half of C1 divided by three halves C1. So this C1 is going to cancel this one. So this is going to give me, this is going to cancel. So, is that right? Yeah. So this should give me one third of C1. Okay. So I'm just going to leave it that way because one third of that is what? 3.3333333. So I'll leave it this way. Okay. So that's that part. So the next thing we now know is that CEQ is created from two guys which were in parallel, which means we're just simply gonna add them together. So you get C12 plus then C3. So this guy then was equal to what? One third of C1 plus C4. So C4 again was what? Four, right? <clears throat> so this is gonna be about 7.33 microfarads, right? Okay, so this was 3.33 microfarads. Is okay? Good. Now from here, what I said is the next thing we want to do is actually find QEQ and then go backwards. Now, I'm going to tell you in this case, I somewhat lied to you in a way. Now, in this case, I actually don't have to find QEQ. And why don't I have to find QEQ? Because where did CEQ come from? Two things that were connected in what? In parallel, right? What's the same in parallel? Potential, right? So what that means then is since this guy is, has a potential, where that potential is the same as the battery, that means that since these two came from this, or this guy came from these two, which were in parallel, that means that these two also have to have the same potential as this guy, not the same charge. So I could find QEQ, that's fine. It's not gonna hurt anything, but it's not gonna do anything for me either because QEQ is kind of irrelevant because these two came from two things which were in parallel, not two things which were in series. If it was two things that came from series, then I would have to find QEQ because the charge on them would be the same as QEQ. But in this case, since this came from two things in parallel, then this and this have to have the same potential, which is exactly that of the battery. So from here, I don't actually have to find QEQ. All I know is that this guy has a potential. This guy has the same potential, but those potentials are the same as the battery. All right. Okay? Good. So now, <clears throat> I now know the potential here. I now know C3 here. I know the potential here. I know C12 here. So I can find the charge here and here. So let's do that. So from here, we can now find Q3 is equal to the potential from the battery times C3. So this is simply equal to 400 microcoulombs. 100 times four, not even I can screw that one up, it's four. Yep. Okay? Here, we can then say Q12 then is equal to V times C12, where C12 was equal to 3.33 times 100. So this is equal to 333 microcoulombs. Is okay? Now, before we do the energies, now let's keep going. Now, what I know is that C12 came from two things which were in series. Again, what I know is what's the same in series is the charge which means the charge here is exactly the same as the charge here, which is exactly equal to Q12. So from here, I now know that the charge here is Q12 and the charge here is also Q12. Now that I know the charge here and the capacitance here, I can now find the voltage. I know the charge here, I know the capacitance here, I can also find the voltage. So let's do that. So finally, what I know is that do that in the next page. V1 is then equal to, so this is going to be what? Q12 divided by C1. It's going to be Q12 divided by C1. Where Q12 was equal to, what was Q12? Uh, v divided by C1. So this is equal to V uh, C12 divided by C1. 
Okay. V12 was equal to what? One third of C1. So this is then equal to one third of the potential. Because <clears throat> this guy is one third of this guy. So the C1s are going to cancel, it gives me one third. So I have one third of 100. One third of 100 is 33.3 volts. That's V1. V2 then is equal to Q12 divided by C2, which is then equal to, again, V. C12 divided by C2, but C2 was what, half of C1, is that right? Yeah. So one half of C1. So this is equal to what? One third V1C1 divided by one half C1. So these guys are gonna cancel, so this becomes two thirds. So this is then two thirds of V. So two thirds is then what, 66.7. Okay, good. So here, all we're gonna do now is tally what we know for each one of the capacitors. So for C1, what do we know for C1? We know the voltage one is equal to one third of V, which is then equal to 33.3 volts. We know that the charge Q1 is equal to charge Q12, which was equal to um, 333 microcoulombs. And then finally, we can say the energy stored U1 then is equal to, in this case, we know Q and we know V. So we can just write this as one half of Q1 V1. So plug my numbers, what I found in this case then is that the amount of energy stored there is equal to 0 0.0055 joules. C2, we know C2, the voltage V2 is then equal to two thirds of the potential, which means that this is 66.7 volts. The charge Q2 was also equal to the charge Q12, which is then equal to 333 microcoulombs, which means the energy U2 is equal to one half of Q2 times V2, but since V2 is twice the size of that, this is simply equal to twice the amount of energy as so take that guy, multiply by two, and what you get in that case then is V2 is equal to 0 0.0111 joules apart. Okay. Come on, good. Finally, C3. We know that the potential across V3 is simply that of the battery, which is equal to 100. Volts. We know that Q3 was then equal to, I'm going to go back to what Q3 was. Q3 was equal to 400 microcoulombs. And then finally, the energy 3 is equal to one half of Q3 V3. Uh, plug in our numbers for that one, we find that it's equal to about 0 0.02 joules. Is okay. So again, these are not hard problems. They're just kind of tedious in the fact that you have to go all the way one direction and then all the way back in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Now here, of course, this was all dealing with just three capacitors. So as you start adding more and more and more and more capacitors, the amount of tediousness, tediousness, there we go. I invented a new word, tediousness becomes even greater, right? So uh, I have one more example dealing with these things, but we'll do that tomorrow because I forgot to close my blackboard, but I have your exams back. Yeah, so not quite as nice as I was hoping, but you know, these things happen. Um, let's see here. So you did about six points worse than previous last year who had almost identically the same exam. Um, so, you know, is what it is. So the average was about a 58, like 58 and a quarter or something like that. So not quite as nice as I would like to see, but you know, 
it happens. Uh, I kind of griped a little bit yesterday. Again, if you're going to do an integral, make sure there's a D something. Otherwise, the integral is completely nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and I actually did uh, gender statistics too, just for funsies. Uh, and I got to say, guys, the girls are beating you by like 20 points. Slaughtering you at this stage. But so that's about as much as I'm going to say about that. So I'll give these back. And then I will see everybody tomorrow. So, okay, nice thing about this exam is this is a good place to make up for it. A lot of the stuff is going to be nice and easy. Mostly the algebra. All right, I'll see you already tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll finish. We'll do another example of this. We'll start talking about what are known as dielectrics. I know we've done, and then we start talking about currents. What's up, Richie? I just need to explain this one to him. Sure. Because I saw and I 